too many turkey leftovers. Yep, you know, we have some leftovers. Um, not too much, fortunately, but, you know, it always kind of surprises me when people don't like a traditional Thanksgiving dinner. I guess it really shouldn't surprise me. Nobody likes everything, but it's definitely one of my favorite meals of the year. And Thanksgiving on a roll as a leftover is just a great thing. I love it. So thank you, Brian. Uh, yes, it is the first week of Advent this week, and the theme for this week being hope. Hope. And Advent simply means the arrival of a person or an event, and in this case, it's us looking forward to the arrival of Jesus into the world. You know, Each week leading up to Christmas, there's a different theme. This week it's hope, but then it'll be joy, love, and peace. And personally, I think those are all things that the world could use more of and would welcome. So I like Advent. You know, Advent means that Christmas season is here. And I am still surprised that we are finally getting to the end of 2020 and that in a couple of days it's going to be December already. So, you know, ringing out 2020 this year may be the biggest celebration ever, I think. I think there's going to be a lot of partying to get rid of 2020. Uh, not sure anybody's going to miss it, but my encouragement to you is in the midst of all that happening, because I know that's probably going to be the theme this year, but in the midst of all that happening, I just really encourage you not to dwell on the bad things of this past year, but to dwell on the good things. You know, you remember Mac and our whole study on Philippians that kind of showed us how to get happy and stay happy, right? Philippians 4, 8 says, fix your thoughts on what is true and good and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and dwell on the fine, good things in others. Think about all you can praise God for and be glad about. And then at the end of that thought in the next verse, Paul says, then the God of peace will be with you. It's a choice that we make. You can fix your thoughts on the bad stuff and stay upset about things, or you can fix your thoughts on the good things and have peace. I choose peace. And, you know, the Bible has all sorts of good advice for us if we would just open it up and read it. You know, it has what we need to have a fulfilling and purpose-filled life. And when we put what it says into action, you find that your life comes into order, that things start to make sense. We understand that there's more to what we see and our lives have meaning. God becomes more personal and closer. And... Of course, we don't always get it right. I fall short of what the Bible says all the time. And that's why I'm thankful that God's grace is there to encourage me to get back up and keep trying. You know, God never uses a stick to beat you into submission. He's always there with an outstretched hand, inviting you to come on a walk with him or to pick you up when you stumble. It's a journey that we're on, both as individuals and together. And the Bible says in Romans 12, 5, it says Christ makes us one body and individuals who are connected together to each other. We are very much individuals. We're uniquely created. We have our own skills and backgrounds, strength and weaknesses. But all of that is connected into one body. One beautiful meld of all those different talents and personalities where we can collectively leverage our strengths and compensate for each other's weaknesses. And we can accomplish some really big things together. Things that are much bigger than anything we could do as individuals. And over the past weeks, I've been focusing our messages on being together. On how we're created for community. How we rise up through relationships. We're tougher together. We're formed to be a family. We've covered a whole bunch of things and looked at all the ways and the advantages of being together. And we know that what God loves, the devil hates, and God loves us getting closer together and embracing our differences, so the devil comes after that, and he tries to break down our relationships with each other. And I told you that the Bible does a pretty good job of showing what breaks down relationships and what restores and protects relationships. So for this week and next, I just want to continue to look at those things from a biblical standpoint. Why relationships fall apart, why relationships go bad what destroys relationships, and what rebuilds them, right? And like I told you last time, these are all things that can be applied to every relationship in your life. Friends, family, your marriage if you're married, your work, your career, and of course, your life group. 
if we follow what the Bible says about how to get along with each other, we're going to find that all of our relationships get stronger. And collectively, we're going to save those hours in therapy for the people who don't tap into the wisdom that their designer left them in Scripture. So before we get into it, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning, Lord. I thank you for family. I thank you for friends. I thank you for relationships that we all have, Lord. So, Father, as we just press in to understand what makes relationships better and stronger, Lord God, as we seek to to glorify you and, and to make you happy in seeing us have relationships with each other, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in us, that you would guide us, and that you would uh, just teach us exactly what you'd have us learn. So this morning, Lord God, I pray that your word would come alive to us, Father, that each one here could know what it is to have a deeper relationship, not only with each other, but also with you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first thing we saw last week was that it was selfishness that breaks relationships down. But selflessness, that will fix, restore, and protect relationships. And the scripture that brings that all home for us was James 4, verses 1 or 2, where it says, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what other has. You find ways to take it away from them. Simply put, it's selfishness that causes problems in relationships. Selfishness is a natural human emotion. We're born with it. Nobody has to teach us to be selfish. It's in our nature. Our culture caters to our natural desire to think of ourselves first and that we're always on the lookout for number one, me. And Proverbs 8, 28, 25 says selfish people just cause trouble. Selfishness destroys relationships, but selflessness builds them up, being unselfish. A little bit less of me and a little bit more of you. I'm not the whole center of the universe. I'm thinking about other people. I'm looking out for one another's interests, like it says in Philippians 2.4. That's selflessness. Selflessness, selflessness brings out the best in others, and it builds relationships. So today I want to look at another one. All right, so here's the second thing that destroys relationships, and it's kind of another big one, pride. Pride. This is the second big thing that kills relationships. Pride destroys relationships. Proverbs 13.10 tells us pride leads to arguments. The NIV says it where, where there is strife, there is pride. So if you've got strife, pride is in there somewhere. And in many ways, pride is really just another form of selfishness. You know, I'm up here and you're down here. And pride can sometimes show up in ways that we don't notice. So I want to do something this morning. Do you guys remember the Jeff Foxworthy skit, right? This guy here and his big claim to fame is, you know, you might be a redneck if whatever, fill in the blank, like... If your bicycle has a gun rack, or if your wife has a jello mode that looks like Elvis, or if your brother in law is your uncle, you might be a redneck. Right? Now, I'm going to repent for that right now, right away, because as we're going to see, all of those statements could really be made in pride. They could be made in pride. But the idea behind the joke is basically hey, I don't want to accuse you of anything. But if you've got these things kind of going on in your life, well, then you might be a redneck or you might want to look at what you're doing, right? So I thought I'd use that for these next points about how pride hides in ways that you don't always recognize. I'll give you some signs to what's going on and then you can decide if you might have a pride problem, okay? So here's one way that pride creeps in. Pride can creep in when we're critical of people. When you find yourself critical of other people, that's usually pride. When you're judgmental of people, when you look down on them, when you're picky about what they're doing, or very much so in my case, of how they're driving, then you might have a pride problem. And I'll be honest with you, you know, the Holy Spirit has really been taking me to school on this one as I've been driving lately, probably for the last two months or so. 
You know, I, I, I find myself making this kind of, you know, why are you driving so slow? Why can't you change lanes properly? Do you even know who has the right of way out here right now? Do you need to let the whole town turn ahead of you, you know, when you're making that turn? But the Holy Spirit showed me that all of that is pride. Because clearly, nobody drives as well as I do. Right? My driving's up here. Your driving's down here. Right? You're a terrible driver. I'm an excellent driver. It's all pride. And I just, I thank God for grace because I'm having a terrible time learning to improve this one. And I am taking a grace bath every day. And I will tell you, it really smarts when you remind yourself that that's pride talking. So the Holy Spirit's been doing some work on me in that one, and I'm grateful for it. I'm still on my way. But James 5, 9 says this, says, don't grumble about each other. Are you yourselves above criticism? Right? Pride about complaining about people. So here's another way pride sneaks in. Pride sneaks in when you find yourself being over competitive about what you have versus what people you consider your peers have. You find yourself comparing. You know, look at her dress compared to my dress. I drive this car, they're still driving a whatever. You know, I've been promoted two times already, and my college roommate, he's still struggling to find a job. My family's making way more than my sister's family. Her husband's a loser, right? My kids are on the honor roll or got into these great schools. You know, what about yours? Whatever it is, if you're doing a lot of comparing, you might have a pride problem. That comparing spirit of always looking at everybody else and comparing and judging that might be a pride problem. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 3, it says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. How about this one? Pride also sneaks in through stubbornness. Stubbornness. So if you find that it's difficult for you to say, I'm sorry. If you kind of choke on apologies or struggle to admit when you're wrong. Or if you try to apologize by avoiding to make yourself look bad. Kind of like saying, oh, I'm sorry if I may have offended you. That's not really an apology. That's, that's kind of what politicians say. So if you're struggling in all these ways, you might have a pride problem. If I may have offended you, that puts it back on them. Like it's your fault that I was offended, that you were offended. That's not an apology. An apology is, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And if you can't do that, you might have a pride problem. Proverbs 11.2 says, too much pride can put you to shame. It's wiser to be humble. Here's one more for you. Another way that pride kind of sneaks in undercover. And it's by being shallow. Shallow, and maybe not the shallow you're thinking of. It's, it's having shallow relationships. If you keep everything kind of superficial in your life, and you never let anybody get close to you, kind of keep them at arm's distance. You deflect through humor to kind of keep things from getting too deep. You're kind of faking it a lot, and you're wearing a mask. If you do that, if you can't be authentic with people, if you find it hard to be authentic with people, you might have a pride problem. When you're too shallow to kind of care what other people think, that's pride. That your time is too important to be bothered with others. That your baggage, if you're having trouble sharing your own stuff, your baggage is too delicate or too sensitive or too unique that nobody would understand. But we're supposed to be there for each other, and you can't do that if you stay shallow. Galatians 6, 2 says, help carry each other's burdens. In this way, you follow Christ's teaching. Being critical and judgmental, being overly competitive and comparing yourself to others, being stubborn and being shallow in your relationships, all of these are ways that you might have a pride problem. Or me. Or me. And... The problem with pride 
is that it's kind of self-deceiving. Everybody else can kind of see it, but we don't. When I'm full of pride, I don't see it. I don't see it, which is why I kind of listed these things out to you. You kind of, well, you don't maybe even see these things, but you might have a pride problem. I might have a pride problem. I know I have a pride problem. So the Bible says this in Proverbs 16, 18. It says, pride comes before disaster and arrogance before a fall. And this is even kind of neatly worded in the message paraphrase in, in, in almost a better way. Yeah. First pride and then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. Which means, you know, if you kind of had a hard fall and, and you're kind of feeling it like, okay, you had this fall, your ego got hurt or something like that, your ego may be getting a little bit large, right? So if you've had this fall, you've got to examine yourself and say, hey, where was my ego during this whole thing? Pride destroys relationships. Now, like I said last week, for each one of these things that the Bible tells us destroys relationships, there's also something the Bible tells us that reverses the damage as well. Last week, it was selfishness that destroyed relationships, and it was selflessness that repairs and protects them. For pride, the antidote is humility. Humility is what restores and protects relationships. Peter talks all about what walking like a follower of Christ looks like. And in 1 Peter 3, 8, he gives us five things that we should be doing on our walk. He says this, he says, we should, all of you, be harmonious, sympathetic, loving, compassionate, and humble. These things all kind of work together and build upon the last one, which is to be humble. And if you take a look at these five things, doesn't that really kind of sum up what we all want to be doing in our families and in our life groups and in our relationships? We want to live in harmony. We want to be sympathetic. We want to love each other. We want to have compassion. And all of those things are accomplished by being humble. Like, I like the first one, like be harmonious. Be harmonious. It's kind of po poetic way of saying live in harmony. That's the way God wants to be with each other, in harmony. And I love that because one of the ways that musical harmony is defined is this, it says, it's the simultaneous combination of different tones, especially when blended into chords pleasing to the ear. That's pretty cool because you only get harmony in music when you combine different tones, blend them together into a chord that is pleasing to the ear. And you only get harmonious relationships when you combine different types of people and blend them into the relationships that are pleasing to the Lord. It's just not as beautiful when everyone is the same. It's the blending of differences that makes a harmony a pleasing sound, and it's the blending of different people and personalities that make beautiful relationships. You know, I can honestly tell you that the friends that I value most in my life are the ones who are most different from me. The ones who have different passions, the ones who have different outlooks, different backgrounds, the ones who accept my differences, the ones where we both accept each other's viewpoints. And the only way that happens is with humility. Because harmony and humility go hand in hand. I'm actually not even sure harmony is possible without humility. You kind of have to have them together. You know, in a symphony, it's the beauty of all the different instruments that makes it sound good. If you get a trumpet player who wants to stand up on the chair and play louder than everyone else, it kind of just ruins the whole thing. And if you have a person, you know, in your group or in your life who's just all the time saying, look at me, look at me, and they don't kind of let other people get noticed... It kind of ruins the joy and the harmony and the deepness and the richness that God wants to give into our lives because of that. So it's humility that restores and protects relationships. So how do we grow in humility? How does that happen in our lives? 
Well, I believe it happens by letting Jesus Christ begin to control our thoughts and our hearts and our attitudes and our reactions. Jesus has got to be part of us because if you could have changed it on your own, you probably would have. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, it says, let the spirit change your way of thinking and make you into a new person. A new person. Well, how do I become that? How do I become a new person? How do I start to think in a different way? Well, I will tell you that a fundamental truth about relationships is this. It's that we tend to become like the people we spend time with. If you spend time with grumpy people, you're going to tend to be more grumpy. If you spend time with happy people, you're going to get to be more happy. And if you want to have more humility in your life, you need to spend time with someone who is truly humble. If you want to have more humility, you need to spend time with Jesus Christ. He's humble. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you and I to spend time with him in prayer and reading his word and talking to him so that we can learn that, we can become more like him. He's humble. By spending time with him and in his word, we see and learn his humility. And we absorb that into our nature as well. What do I love about this message that we have that we call the good news? It's that I can change. That I can be a better person. That I'm challenged to be a better person. And that God wants to help me do that. I follow Jesus because he makes me into the kind of person that I want to be here and now in this lifetime. And nobody's done anything more humble than what Jesus did when he came from heaven to earth to become a man, to live for us, to give us his life, and to be resurrected for us. And you know, I, I don't think we always appreciate the humility that it took to do that. You know, I think after you've heard it so many times and it's in songs and all these other things, we kind of just kind of take it for granted. Like Jesus just walked down some grand staircase and zipped up a flesh suit and started walking around. But it was so much more than that. I mean, just think for a moment what it must have been like for God, God, to become a man. From being in a place where he just said words and something happened and things happened. To having to have to go out and do it yourself from being indestructible to having this flesh suit on that rips and breaks and bleeds, from having never felt hunger, never needing to eat, to feeling what it's like to have hunger pangs, to know what it's like to be hungry. From leading the nation of Israel out of Egypt with signs and wonders and parting the Red Sea to being completely vulnerable as an infant, relying on Mary and Joseph to care for him and to change his diapers. To be cold, to get sick, to feel pain, to need to work and make a living. All these things are not what it's like to be God. It's what it's like to be a human being. And to voluntarily take these things on, all of these things, the pain, the suffering, all of it, that's what humility is. And that's how Jesus humbled himself for us. He made himself less so that we could be more. And being humble with each other is really the key to building and restoring relationships. Philippians 2 says this is, Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Your attitude should be the kind that was shown by Jesus Christ, who, though he was God, didn't demand and cling to his rights as God, but humbled himself to death on a cross. He humbled himself. I will tell you that humility is a surefire cure to almost any relationship problem you have or could have. Just make sure that you've got your perspective right and you understand that humility is not you thinking less of yourself. 
You thinking less of yourself, that's insecurity. And spoiler alert, we're going to see that's actually another thing that kind of take relationships down. But that's not this week. Humility is knowing that you have it. You have what it takes. You've got the stuff like Jesus did. But you're not looking at that as a gift or a privilege, but you're looking at it as more of a responsibility. C.S. Lewis describes humility as humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's not about us putting ourselves down. It's just about not thinking about ourselves so much. It's about thinking of others more. And the only way you're going to get that kind of humility is to hang out with someone who already has it. Jesus has got it. And when I spend time with him and I spend time around him, that enables me to become more humble. And humility is what builds relationships. And I think humility is also what kind of brings hope in certain areas of life. This first week of Advent focuses on hope. And to build hope and to promote hope, I think also takes humility. Now, hope to the homeless and poor is brought when people are humble about what they've been given by God. When they know that their wealth is not only for us to enjoy. When you know that God doesn't just bless us, he blesses through us. When we think of ourselves less. I think it's humility that brings hope to saving that hurting marriage. Marriage isn't only a gift or a privilege, it's also full of responsibility. And humbling yourselves to each other and to God is what gives hope that a marriage can be saved. I think we could have more hope for our nation if our government, you know, our government, our courts, our schools, if we as a nation could humble ourselves before God, recognizing that the blessings that we enjoy, the laws that we have are founded in faith in God and founded in scripture, founded by men and women wanting to worship freely. And let's not forget the greatest hope, your hope for a life beyond this life and into eternity is found when you humble yourself before God. Humility and hope go hand in hand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God. I thank you for hope. I thank you for all of the hope that you give to us, that your scripture just reiterates over and over and over again. Father, I just, I just put myself before you now, Lord God, and just I recognize that I am not humble in many ways. And Lord, I want to be humble. I want to have humility in my life. I want to have good relationships with other people, Lord God. I want to see that well up in my life, Lord. So Father, I pray that you would teach me. I pray for others here who want the same thing, that you would teach them what it means to be humble. Father, I pray it doesn't come through huge hurtful lessons, Lord God. I pray that your Holy Spirit can just kind of gently nudge us into that way, that you would reveal our nature, kind of the way that you've been revealing it to me, Lord, in my driving. Father, that you just continue to remind me when it's pride. Continue to show me when my pride wells up. Father, I pray that humility would be a character trait I was known for, Lord God. Humility would be a character trait that all of your people would be known for. So, Lord, I humbly submit to you as you teach me to be humble, Lord. I pray for each person here, Lord God, as, as they push into wanting to be humble, Lord, that you would just reveal yourself to them, that you would reveal your character to them, and that we could walk in victory in this particular area. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, again, I hope you have somebody else with you as you're watching this. And as we kind of wrap this up, I want to give you the opportunity to talk about this in your group for a few moments. And there's a few things I want you to talk about. I want to encourage you to talk about. I want to talk about um, humility and pride. I want to kick around for a little bit how humility can strengthen a group, how your group can be stronger because of people being humble. And then I also want to kind of shine a light on how pride can weaken your group. How your group doesn't do so well when people are standing in pride. So those two things and then 
Uh, Micah 6, verses 6 through 8. Uh, I encourage you to go ahead and read that as a group and just kind of see what that means to you. And then, as always, to just take some time to pray and minister to each other. So uh, I hope you do that now. And, and Lord, I just pray that you just bless your people now and bless these discussions, Father. Bless these homes, Lord. Father, I pray again for every person who has gotten together today, Lord God, that there would be no transmission of this virus, Lord God, that you would keep us protected and safe and sound and, and, and secure, Lord. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. That's it. I love you guys. Be blessed. I'm happy Christmas season is upon us. It's underway. I hope you can enjoy it. Keep hope alive. Stay safe. God bless you. To see things like you do, God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from, give me wisdom, you know just what to do, oh.